For today's example, we're going to show a few different ways of plotting uncertainty using ggplot. Um, specifically, we're going to show how to look at uh, box plots, at histograms, at violin plots, and at density plots. Um, these are all different ways of looking at a single variable, either by itself or across the values of a different variable, like different categories. Um, and to do this, we're going to look at weather data that I downloaded from darksky.net. Um, they have an API that lets you download historical data. That's unfortunately going away in the next year or so because Apple just bought them. So hopefully some other website will provide cool weather API data. Um, in the meantime, if you go to the class website for today, there's a CSV file there of um, daily weather conditions in Atlanta, uh, the exact spot as we talked about with the area with dark sky, they're very good at narrowing down um, actual like tiny geographic areas. Um, this is the location of the Andrew Young School, um, the actual like latitude and longitude of that. And so this is weather at the Andrew Young School at noon from January 1st, 2019 to January or to December 31st, 2019. So we're going to play with that and it should be fun. We'll see some cool patterns. Um, so we're going to quickly create a brand new RStudio project and put the data set in the, in the correct folder and then we'll start working with it and, and seeing some patterns. So go ahead and download that CSV file and then if you open up RStudio, we can go to File, New Project. We're going to create a new project just somewhere on our computer here. Um, at this point, you may just have a single project for this whole class and that's fine. Um, what I'm doing in these examples is just, again, getting you used to the idea of creating a project, um, what a project look like, looks like. It's just a folder um, and working with that specific project so that you don't have to worry about working directories and, and repointing R to specific folders. It makes life a lot easier. So we're going to create a new directory. It's going to be an R project. We're going to just put it on the desktop. In real life, you'll put this somewhere real. Um, we're going to call this weather uncertainty uncertainty, but spell it correctly, uncertainty. And we'll stick it on the desktop and it will close our studio and open it back up, point it at that folder. Okay, so now just to verify, if we look at the console here, it says it's pointed at desktop slash weather uncertainty, which is good. If we look up at the top here, we see that it's set to the weather uncertainty project. And if we look here in the files, files panel, we're in desktop slash weather uncertainty, and there's just one thing in there. This is the tiny rproj file that just says this is an RStudio project. Um, so if we go to that folder in Finder or Windows Explorer, we'll go to the desktop. I have this folder called weather uncertainty. I'm going to make a new folder in here called data, which you can just right click and hit new folder. And I'm going to drag the CSV file that I downloaded into the data folder and we should be ready to go. So if we come back to our studio, now we have our data folder, and we have our weather uncertainty project. So we're gonna create a new R markdown file. We're gonna go file, new, R markdown. Just hit enter, because we don't care about changing those, because we can change them here. So we'll just say weather stuff, you can put your name there, whatever. And so we're gonna select from here all the way down, delete, and we should have an empty R markdown file with some metadata up at the top and we should be ready to go. So let's save this because that's a good thing to do. Um, we'll just save this as weather. We can call it whatever we want. And we are ready. So we're gonna start with a heading here because we're getting into good practice of mixing prose and code. So our prose here, we might have like introduction where we explain what's happening in the data here. And we say we got this data from dark sky, et cetera. And so we're just explaining all the methodology, hooray. Then we'll have a section called load data. So to, to load the data, we're gonna insert a new chunk. So you can go to the insert chunk menu here or press command option I or control alt I on windows and it'll insert a chunk for you. So we want this chunk, this is where we're gonna load our libraries and load our data. So we need to load the tidyverse library. That's all we're gonna work with for now. And so if we press command enter, it'll run just that line. Or if we press control shift enter, it'll run the whole chunk. Um, remember, we have all of this output here, these warnings and messages. We don't really need to worry about them because tidyverse is just a very talkative package when you load it. So we can turn those off. If you click on the gear icon, 
You can tell it to not show warnings and to not show messages. And good practice is to name this, and so we can say load packages data. Sure. Okay, so now when we run this, there's no message, there's no warning, it just loads tidyverse and we're good. Because we named the chunk, it shows up in our table of contents here, which is nice. So we can see that we have our weather stuff, that's our title, and then we have our introduction, and we can click on load data, and it will um, jump up to that section, and then there's our load packages data chunk. So we're good to go. Um, so now we need to load this CSV file that's in our data folder into R so we can do stuff with it. So we're going to make a new data set called ATL underscore weather. And this is going to be read underscore CSV. And then we give it a path to the data set, which is in data slash. And then if I just hit tab, it should auto complete it. Or you can type the whole name of the file that works too. So now if I click on play or press command shift enter or control shift enter, it will show that we have the Atlanta weather data set. And if you look at this, dark sky actually includes a ton of information. Um, so this is the, the time, January 1st at 5 a.m. This is at um, London time, so it's, it's noon, um, I think. Unless it's middle of the night, we'll have to check that. Um, we'll just pretend it's at noon. We might find that it's not. Um, so if you look through, it shows the actual summary for the weather that day, light rain in the morning and afternoon, sunrise time, sunset time, etc. We get all sorts of information. Um, so what we're going to work with as we play with this is we have temperature low and temperature high, and there's also probability of raining that day we could look at. There's a wind speed variable here somewhere, humidity, there's wind speed. So we'll, we'll just play with wind speed and temperature just because those feel fairly easy to work with. Um, one thing we're going to do really quick, um, just to make it easier to facet by specific var variables or um, um, group by or fill by different variables, is we're going to create two new columns here based on this column, the time column here. So right now this has the time, but it's an entire timestamp where we have the year and the month and the day and the time all wrapped up into one column. But if we want to have like a histogram for every month, we want a column that is just January or, or just shows January, February, March, etc. Um, so to do that, we need to extract the month from that timestamp. And there's a really convenient way to do this. There's a uh, our package called Lubridate. Um, I think we've used it before. Um, so this just makes it easier to work with dates. So we'll just add that up to our libraries because it's best practice to kind of keep all of the libraries up at the top, just so you know what you're working with so a, a new library doesn't appear in the middle of the script. Um, so if we run that now, it's going to load Tidyverse again. Now we have Lubridate. And now we can do stuff with Lubridate. We are going to um, add a pipe here, and we're going to mutate. We're going to add a new column called month. And we'll, yeah, month equals. And the function that we use to extract the month out of that date column is called month. And so if we open parentheses, we have to feed it the column we want to extract, and that just happens to be called time. Um, if you look at the the data set here, that column is named time, um, even though it's mostly just a date because it's the same time, but that's just the name of it. So we want to convert month um, and then month or month equals the extracted month from that time column. So if we run this and we come back to our data set and we scroll all the way to the end, we should have a new column called month. And this is showing one. And if we scroll down far enough, it'll switch to two and to three and to four. Um, but we want these to be more human readable instead of just like one and like one through 12. And so there's actually an argument inside month that we can use. Um, if we look at the help file for month, it'll actually show us what the different arguments are. So we'll come to help and search for month. And if we scroll down, there's an argument called label equals false by default. If we say label equals true, and now we run it and we look at Atlanta weather. Now we have Jan and Feb and Mar 
which is better than the numbers, but we don't want them abbreviated. And so if you look back at month, there's also an argument for ABBR, and by default, it abbreviates. So we can say ABBR equals false. So it's going to label it, it's not going to abbreviate it. So now if we run that, and we look at ATL weather, it should show the full month name, January, February, March, neat. That worked. Um, so another column we want to add really quick that we can work with is the weekday. Um, so we can see if there's any patterns, if Mondays are hotter than Fridays, or if Tuesdays are windier than Thursdays or something. So we can make a new column here called weekday. And this is going to equal, um, we're going to extract the weekday out of the date. The function for that is wday. Um, and that will extract the weekday out of a column. And so the column we want to extract it from is called time. And we'll do the same label equals true and ABBR equals false so that we get the full name of the day instead of SUN and MON, etc. So if we run that now and we look at ATL weather, we should have two new columns, one for month, one for weekday. Neat. Okay, we can start doing stuff now. So we've loaded and cleaned the data. We have a couple new columns we can start working with. So let's do some histograms and see what um, the wind speed typically looks like in downtown Atlanta. So we're going to make a new heading here called box or histograms. I'll hit enter a bunch of times so it's in the middle. So we're going to insert a new chunk. We're going to make a histogram, just a single histogram of one variable here of our um, wind speed. So we're going to say ggplot. The data set we're using is ATL weather. And then our mappings are going to be AES. We're going to say on the x axis, we want wind speed. And I know that because I did this before, but this is the name of the column lowercase w, uppercase s. If we look at Atlanta weather here, there's a column in here somewhere that's wind speed spelled that way. And that's how we know to use it. So if we scroll around, it's not updating the column names. There we go. They all follow that same pattern. Sunrise time, sunset time, moon phase. So somewhere in here it says wind speed. If we scroll over, there it is. So that's the column we're using, wind speed. So we're just going to do x equals wind speed because it will figure out the y for us. It'll make those categories or those bins or those uh, buckets. And we're going to say geom underscore histogram. So if we run this, we should get a histogram. Oh, it's because I said mappings instead of mapping. So we switch it to mapping and now it should work. thinking about it. There it is. So there's our wind speed in Atlanta, the distribution of different wind speeds. Notice how it yells at you um, and says right now it's just it made 30 bins for you, um, but you need to choose a better value. And so it's always going to say, pick your own number of bins or your own bin width. So we're going to make our own bin width here. We'll say bin width equals something. If we look down here, we don't want like bin width equals 10 because our whole range is from like 0 to 10-ish. And so if we said 10, it'd just be one giant column. Um, it might be okay to just have one. So every one mile an hour is going to be its own bin. So we'll say bin width equals 1. It's good practice to add a border here. So we'll say color equals white. So if we run this now, we should get our bin width equals 1 and then the white border. That looks cool. Um, one other thing we might want to do is set the boundary here because right now like if you look at three This isn't showing the number of days where the wind speed was Between like three and four. It's really showing where the wind speed was between two and a half and three and a half which Neat it works, but um, for interpretability We, we might want to shift these all up so it, it actually lines up on a number so to do that inside geom histogram we can say boundary equals and we can just give it a number and it'll base everything else on that number so if we say equals one that means one of these bars will start at exactly one and then the next one will start at two and three etc so if we run it now 
um, it worked. It's just now this x-axis scale is kind of goofy. Um, so now 2.5 is in the middle, which means that this is 2 and that is 3. So we have the right boundaries, but the, the x-axis is wonky. We can fix that. Let me show you how you fix that really quick. Um, as you had practiced with last week, the way you manipulate the different um, aesthetics is with the scale function for it. So here we have scale x continuous. And one of the options here that you've noticed in this tooltip is breaks. So we can say breaks equals, and so in, right here it's just saying breaks are going to be 2.5, 5, 5 7.5, etc. But we can specify our own if we use the sequence function, which means we're going to go from 0 to, how high does that go? To 12? We'll go to 12. 0 to 12 by 1. So instead of, like, it's just going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So if we run that, now we can see the wind speed down at the bottom. So this is the count of days where the wind speed was between 2 and 3, and between 3 and 4, between 4 and 5, etc., all the way up to 12. So that works pretty well. So that is for a single variable there, um, which looks nice. But what if we want to see if there's any differences in months? Maybe winter months are windier than, than summer months. So what we can do is if we just copy this whole code here, and we scroll down, we're going to insert a new chunk, and we're going to add another aesthetic to our plot. So instead of just x equals wind speed, we can say fill equals month, because we have that month column that we created. So now if we plot it, we get this hideous plot. Um, we have each of the months as a specific color, which is neat, but they're all stacked on top of each other, and that's really hard to make any comparisons. So one thing we can do is we can facet this um, by month instead of having it all overlaid on top of each other like this. So to do that, we can just add a facet layer. So we can say facet underscore rep. And the variable that we're going to facet by is month. And we should now get 12 little plots like that. Um, it tries to fit it in the, in the neatest possible numbers of rows and columns, but if we wanted um, like two rows, we could say n row equals two. And so then it's going to have six across and two down. It's going to be kind of too skinny for this, but it works. So now we can compare January to July, February to August, etc. Um, there's no good option, like it's just however you want this thing to look. We can also get rid of this legend because it's double encoding now, like we have September as that color of green, we don't really need September there. So we can turn that off um, by adding somewhere in this, the order doesn't really matter, we'll just add guides and we say fill equals false and that will turn off the legend for fill. And if we look at it now, we should have 12 little plots all colored by month. And so you can see kind of January is a windier month than August um, or has uh, higher wind speeds than August where most of August was like three miles an hour, but January had lots of high gust days. Um, so that's neat. January is windy. Um, so that's histograms. So now let's do density plots. We'll make a new section here called density plots. So we'll add a new chunk. Um, the nice thing about density plots is they follow the exact same aesthetic mapping as histograms. So we could technically just come up here and grab our first histogram code and paste it down in here. So we're still going to use the Atlanta weather. We're still going to do wind speed on the x-axis. The only thing we're changing now is instead of geom histogram, we want geom density. And density doesn't use bin width, and it doesn't use any of that stuff. And we'll leave the, the fancy breaks, sure. So now if we plot this, there's our density with wind speed down here at 2 up through 12. This is really ugly. This is just a line. Um, it inherently doesn't fill stuff. Like filling is empty by default, so we can just tell it to be filled with like red. That's going to be really bright red. Um, we can also tell it to be filled with like a gray, like a 50% gray. That looks nicer. So now we have the density plot, um, which should have roughly the same shape as our histogram. 
right there. This is just a much smoother version of it. Um, if we want to change the bandwidth, we can do that here. We could say bandwidth equals one, and that should get a little bit, it's basically the same. If we say bandwidth equals like 0.5, it should start getting bumpier, a little bit bumpier. Bandwidth equals 0.1, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, now it's all bumpy because it's looking at very narrow windows of the data to figure out all the calculus behind the curves. Um, if you just leave bandwidth off, it'll figure out the ideal bandwidth and you can generally just be okay with that. So there's our density plot. Um, if we want to show this density plot for all the different months, we can do that too. Um, we'll just copy our density plot code. We'll come down and add a new chunk and paste it. And now we're going to fill by month. So we'll have 12 different density plots. Um, here in geom density, I want to take off this fill because we're going to use the column instead of just making it gray. So now if we run it, we should get nothing because I spelled month wrong. I used a capital M. So we want lowercase m for month. So now if we play it, we should get 12 density plots on top of each other, which is really hard to interpret um, because where's January's peak? Like January is behind everything there. All we can really see is December on top of everything else. So if we want to see through all of these different layers, we can add some transparency. So in geom density, we can say alpha equals like 0.5 to make it 50% transparent. Um, and we should be able to see all 12 months here like that, which again is not great. Um, but you can kind of see like this month has a bimodal wind speed distribution, which is neat. December is mostly down here. So um, we can kind of see some patterns, not a ton of patterns. So what we want to do is try a different way of looking at all of these densities at the same time. And we can do that with the GG ridges package. Um, so I've already installed that. You can install it using the packages panel. I'm going to come back up to where I load all of my libraries and data just because it's good practice to keep your libraries up here. So we're going to use GG ridges. And I'm going to run that line so we have access to it. So now if we scroll back down, we're going to copy this, this overlapping geom density thing. Um, and we're going to make a new chunk and paste that in. And instead of using geom density, we're going to replace that with something called geom underscore um, density ridges. And that's how we make the ridge plot. So if we just leave it like this, geom density ridges just by itself and say run current chunk, it will get mad because it needs something on the y axis. So if you remember uh, density or these ridge plots, they have all of the different density plots, but it has kind of a y axis label for each of them. Um, and so we need to map something to the y axis. So we're going to map the month column to y. So we're saying y equals month, comma, and we'll fill by month as well. So this should now work. And so we should get 12 different overlapping density plots, just like that. Um, so cool. Like you can see December here, it kind of gets a little bit higher wind speeds in June and then shrinks back down though January has high wind speeds, but they also have days where it's not very windy. So that's kind of our bimodal distribution there. It's definitely windier here than it is in September. So you can kind of see some patterns there, which is kind of cool. Um, there's some different options we can set in, in geom density ridges. Um, one thing is scale. This just determines how tall those things are. If we say scale equals five, for instance, it should make really tall curves. So it's really just kind of scaling them up and exaggerating how tall they are so they overlap more. If we bump that down to like scale equals one, they should be fairly flat. If you don't include a scale, it will just figure out one for you. So now there's no overlapping. So you just kind of tinker with this number until it looks good. Um, so rather than wind speed, we can actually, if we want to show temperature, we just have to change one variable. So if we come back to ATL weather, the column we care about is temperature high, which should just be called temperature high. So let's look at the high temperature that day instead of wind speed. 
So we'll change the X mapping from wind speed to temperature high. And we'll make the scale like five, so it's fairly big. Um, we don't want the scale X continuous now because um, the temperatures don't go from zero to 12. They go from like they go up into the 90s. And so if we get rid of that line, we'll just let it automatically figure out the best scale at the bottom. So if we hit play now, we should get a density plot of all of the high temperatures. And look at that. You can see January is cold. It gets hotter up towards the summer. Um, and then it, oddly enough, September was like hotter on average than June. I don't know if that's a normal Atlanta thing. This was my first time in Atlanta. We moved here in July. And so that was kind of a hot fall. And then it dropped from September. Um, oh, no, we're misinterpreting it. So August is fairly high. It's that color there. September was high too. And then it dropped suddenly down to October, dropped a lot to November, dropped a lot to December. So that was like a pretty fast drop off in temperature um, after September. Um, so that's cool. So another thing we can do here is this is kind of hard to interpret because it's backwards. The very top month here is December. So we're going backwards in time. So we want to reverse this y-axis scale so that January is up at the top and December is at the bottom. So we can do that if we come into y equals month. We can wrap month in a function called fct underscore rev, which will reverse month. Right now, month is a factor. So fct re rev means reverse the factor. So it's going to reverse that category. And so now if we run it, it should show January at the top and then December at the bottom. And so that works a lot better, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing we can do is inside geom density ridges, we can add some extra information. We could add a line that shows the median temperature for that day or for that month. And so to do that, there's an argument um, called quantile lines equals true. And if we run that, we should get a whole bunch of different lines in here. This is kind of like a box plot where this is the, the 25th percentile, that's the 75th percentile, that's the median. Um, we probably don't want all three in there because that's a lot of extra lines. And so what we can do is specify we only want the second line. We only want that median line. We don't want that first one. We don't want the third one. So if we say quantiles whoa, in here, so quantiles equals two, that will tell it to only use that second quantile line, which is the median. So now if we run it, now you can see the median temperature each of the months, but also the, the, the general distribution of that temperature, which is cool. Um, one final thing we can do, and this, this I got directly from the documentation of GG ridges. Um, it's not something I have memorized. Um, we can actually, instead of fill this by month, we can fill it by temperature, within each of the months. And so we can have um, kind of a gradient inside of each of these density plots to show how hot it gets and how cold it gets. So to do that, let me just grab the code because I've already written it. Again, this came from like the documentation. I just noticed that that was one of the examples they had, which is cool. So we're gonna use weather ATL. Um, our mappings, we're gonna have X is temperature high, Y is month, but I used lowercase month. Um, the only tricky thing here is this fill equals x. This dot dot x dot dot is um, kind of ggplot's magical way of, of mapping the x value, this temperature, onto the fill in a gradient sort of way. Um, you can't just say fill equals temperature high. Um, so this, this kind of uses what it calculates with the temperature high to, to do that. Um, then we have geom density ridges, but instead of regular ridges, we're going to say geom density ridges gradient. Um, we're going to use the quantile lines, and we're just going to show the median. And then I've added the scale fill viridis so that we can use the cool viridis palette, um, which is good for perceptually uniform scales. Um, and so now if we run this, we should see the same... Um, oh, I didn't call it weather ATL. The data set is called ATL weather. So now if we run it, we should see the same ridge plot, but instead of colors for each of the months, um, we have the temperatures. And so you can see that it's definitely hotter up here. It's definitely colder down here with the purple. 
and that's really cool. Um, we do have it backwards again with December at the top, so we can flip that by coming up to Y and saying FCT REV month. And so if we run that now, we should have January at the top all the way down to December. And this helps show us kind of the, the big jump we had, like September was really hot. Um, because we went from kind of a median temperature of above 90 to just above 70 um, in a month, which is crazy. I don't know if that's normal in Atlanta. I hope not, because September should be fall-like, not like hotter than August. Um, so thanks, global warming. So those are ridge plots. Um, we made some cool graphs. Um, on the website for today, for the example, I actually show you, I give some example code of how to show high and low temperature distributions at the same time. And the way that's distinguished is we, we use the line type aesthetic so that the low temperature is dotted um, on the border and the high temperature is solid. Um, it involves a little bit of reshaping. You have to make the data a little bit longer. Um, but there's an example of that on the course website. You should check it out. Um, then you can see if it's hot, like to see how big of a disparity there is between um, nighttime temperatures and daytime temperatures in each of the months. It's neat. Um, so next, let's look at some box plots and violin plots. So we'll say boxes and violins. So make a new heading down here, violins, violins. So because we're using these headings, it's nice because we can click on the table of contents and look. I've been lazy with the chunk names. I have no idea what chunk three is. I should have named it. We can come back up to chunk three and oh, it's this facet thing. So we can say faceted histogram. Now we have a name for it. If you look at the table of contents, there is faceted histogram. You should do that. Um, so if we come back down to the last chunk with boxes and violins, let's show the box plot of wind speed. So again, this is just ggplot. Our data is ATL weather. The mapping, all we have to do is give it an X axis or an, an X variable. So we're gonna say X equals wind speed. And then we want to use geom box plot. Okay, if we run that, we should get our box plot. So here's the median wind speed for all of the months. Um, there's the minimum wind speed, there's the maximum, and then these outliers are greater than 1.5 times the interquartile range here. Those were super windy days. Um, and there's a handful of outliers out there. So there's our box plot. Um, the nice thing about box plot is we can actually switch from X to Y, and it will draw the same box plot, but now vertically instead of horizontally. Um, if we want multiple box plots, like one per month, we can come here, let's switch this back to x equals wind speed, and we will say fill equals month. And now we should get 12 different box plots, one per month. Neat. Um, if you look over on the y-axis, it actually doesn't use a y-axis because we didn't tell it to. It just kind of made up numbers and stuck the box plots on to its made up numbers. But if we come and say y equals month, then we should get actual values on the side. There it is, with December up to January. And again, that's reversed. We can flip it with FCT underscore REV, and then January will be at the top. Um, so this shows the same information as the, as the overlapping density plots with the GG ridges. Um, but this is more statistical looking with the, with the interquartile ranges and the different percentiles. If you like box plots and you can interpret them quickly, cool, then that's sufficient for you. Um, if not, use the ridge plots because they look cooler and I find them easier to interpret than box plots. Um, so that's how you do a box plot. If you want to do a violin plot, the only thing you have to change is the geom layer. You leave all the aesthetic mappings the same and just switch geom box plot to geom violin. So if we copy this code and insert a new chunk down here and put it there, we're just going to switch this to geom violin and run it. And now we should get the different violin plots, um, which is neat. But violin plots, again, are kind of hard to use, especially like look at January. That is not very useful. Um, because it's super flat and just really long. 
November, we can kind of see that there is two, it's a bimodal distribution with most of the days were three miles an hour, some were five-ish, but that's all we can really tell with the violins. So it's not incredibly helpful. Um, if we want to add points here, we can. Um, we just have to say geom point. If we do that, we'll get a whole bunch of points that are just overlaid on top of the violins. Um, we can shrink those down a little bit. We can say size equals like 0.3. Now we should have a whole bunch of tiny dots. And again, they're over, they're on top of each other and overlapping. We have kind of a overplotting problem. So we can fix overplotting by jittering those things and making them move around a little bit randomly. So we can come into geom point and say position equals position jitter. And if we hit play, we should get a whole bunch of jittered points. And if we don't want them jittered too wide like that, we can actually change that here and say like height equals 0 0.1. That way they're only jittering a tiny bit up and down. Um, yeah, so like these November points aren't going to accidentally get misinterpreted as December points. And so that that's a useful way of looking at it. I'm using violin plots. Um, the last thing we're going to do is combine these, but instead of overlapping them like this, we can use the ggHalves function to split this. And so you have one column uh, like within these different month columns. Um, you have like half a box plot and then points on the other half. So we're going to use the ggHalves function or package to do this. If we scroll back up to the top, um, we'll add that to our libraries here. We'll say library ggHalves. We'll run that so that we have access to the, the new geoms it provides us. So we'll come back down here. Um, instead of using months, because that's 12 months and that's kind of getting really crowded here, we'll use that other column that we made for weekday. Um, if you remember, we had two mutate functions. One was to create the month variable, and then we have a weekday variable. And that's only seven instead of 12. So we can work with that a little bit easier. So we'll add a new chunk, and we're going to plot. So we're going to say ggplot. Our data is ATL weather. Our mapping, we're going to say AES. X is going to be weekday. Y is going to be wind speed. And then we'll just leave it at that because we could add color equals something or fill equals something, but that will apply to all of the layers after. And points don't get a fill to them. And box plots don't, uh, box plots have both fill and color. If you look up here, these are filled by um, month. And so this box part is yellow. If we colored this, then that line and all of the black border around that, that's the color. And so that's, it, it, there are different parts of this geom that get affected by either fill or color. And so down here, if we're going to do a box plot on top of the points, um, or have a violin plot on top of the points next to the box plot, for instance, we don't want to necessarily have all of the layers be filled by something or all of the layers be colored by something. And so instead of having it globally for all of the geoms, we do want X and Y to be global, but that's all. We want color and fill to be specific to the geoms we're using. So we'll just do X and Y, and then we'll add a plus sign. And what we're going to do is do a geom half point. And so if we just do this by itself and look at the plot, notice how we have like Sunday with all of the dots on this side, but it's only on this on the right side of the of the axis line or of the panel line right here, the grid line, um, because it's leaving room for something else to go on the other half. Um, we can control what side that goes on using the side argument. We can say side equals, and then in quotes, we can either do L or R. Um, if we do L, it will put the dots on the left side. If we do R, it'll put it back on the right side. So we'll do L, because why not? And then if we want these colored by day, we can add aesthetics here. Um, at the beginning here, we can say AES. And we want color equals weekday. So now if we do it, we should have points that are colored by weekday all on the left side, which is neat. Now we want to add a box plot. Or we'll do a violin plot on the other side, the half violin. So we'll say geom half 
violin. We're going to fill this by weekday instead of coloring it by weekday. So we'll say AES fill equals weekday. And the side is going to be on the left or on the right. So we're going to say side equals R. So we should have our points that are all jittered on that side, and we have the violin or half violin on the right side showing the distribution, um, which is cool. So if we want, we can make this a rain cloud plot if we just rotate it. Um, if we flip the axes, that should put the density plots up on the top and the dots underneath, and it should look like it's raining. So if we come here and we say chord underscore flip, that will flip the x and y axis, and it should give us a rain cloud plot, just like that. So we have Saturday, the distribution of wind speeds. And so looking at this, it doesn't look like any days are more, are more windier than others. Um, there are like the windiest day last year was on a Sunday and the second windiest day was also on a Sunday. So maybe Sundays are windier. Um, but then the third windiest day was Wednesday and then Thursday and then back to Sunday so, or Friday. Um, so there's probably not any day of the week patterns in windiness, which we can tell here from the graph. Again, if we want to flip this so that Sunday's at the top and Saturday's at the bottom, we just have to reverse the weekday column. So we say FCT underscore REV for weekday. And if we run that, now we should get Sunday at the top down to Saturday. And neat, we have a rain cloud plot. If we wanted, we could add a half box plot on there too. We could shrink some of these dots so there's not so much over plotting. We can go ahead and do that really quick. In geom half point, we can say size equals 0.2. So now we should, get a, we should have a bunch of little tiny dots underneath and that looks even more rain cloudy. That's cool. Um, I really like these rain cloud plots because they show tons of information in a really aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing way. And so that is our document. So if we save it and we knit it, um, which you can knit if you press Command Shift K or Control Shift K, it will automatically click on that knit button for you and start the knitting process. And so um, we can see that it's working through each of these chunks. It's doing our faceted histogram. It should have made that, and then it should move on to the next chunk once it's done there, but I have no idea what that was because we got lazy and stopped naming them. So it's about halfway done. Almost there. Yours should go a lot faster because um, the program I'm using the recording takes up a lot of computer resources to do this live recording stuff, and so it goes really slow. Um, but your computer should go a lot faster because you're not streaming yourself. Um, and there is our, our markdown file. There's our introduction where we explain everything that we did. We load the data. And then there's our histogram and our faceted histogram and our density plots and that ugly plot and our cool ridge plots and our cool temperature ridge plots. And there's box plots, violin plots, and our rain cloud plots. We've got all of that in there. Um, and so there's just a whole bunch of different ways to show uncertainty with ggplot. Um, this is exciting, fun stuff.